Hi again, Kenneth Scott Latterette, A History of Christianity, page 302. Uh, Latterette's chapter is entitled The Byzantine Continuation. He's dealing with the increased tensions between Rome, that is the Western Latin Church, and the Eastern Church, dominated, of course, by the Greek scriptures and continuing to this day to be often called the Greek Church, the Eastern Church, the Orthodox Church. He says, the Pope, who, who was the vigorous Nicholas I, while not at first repudiating his legates in joining in the confirmation of the deposition of Ignatius, did not yet recognize Photius or enter into communion with him. He was eager to extend the control of Rome over the Bulgarians, who, as we are to see, were about to be converted, and also to restore to his direct jurisdiction Illyricum, which had been transferred to the Patriarch of Constantinople, by Byzantine monarchs, who, as Roman emperors, claim that right. The Pope, presumably, would have recognized Photius had the latter acceded to his territorial desires, but this Photius would not do. In 863, the Pope held a synod in Rome, which, acting on the conviction that the papal legates had exceeded their authority in 861, stripped Photius of all ecclesiastical dignity and restored Ignatius to the Patriarchate. The Emperor, Michael III, refused to admit the competence of Rome in such matters and said so frankly to the Pope. In replying, Nicholas I asserted, in no uncertain terms, what he held to be the prerogatives of the Papal See and declared that through the clear words of Christ himself the Popes had power over all the earth, that is, over the entire Church, and insisted that no council of the church could be called without the pope's consent, conveniently disregarding the fact that earlier ecum ecumenical councils had been called by the emperor and had been presided over either by him or by his representatives. Here was an assertion by the pope of the church's independence of the power of the state and of his authority in the church. The latter was not new and practiced even in Constantinople, had been tending in the direction of the former. The situation was still further complicated by developments in Bulgaria. There the king, Boris, under pressure from Constantinople, had accepted baptism from the hands of Greek clergy sent by Photius. Greeks, Armenians, and Paulicians poured into the country instructing the populace in the new faith. Boris wished to have his church free from both Rome and Constant Constantinople and in an effort to gain as favorable terms as possible, played off each against the other. He wished a patriarch of his own, but might compromise on an archbishop. Rome sent two bishops who engaged in instruction and baptism. Missionaries also came from the Franks, who adhered to the Latin form of Christianity. The close juxtaposition of missionaries from the two wings of the church brought into sharp relief the differences which had developed across the years. The Latins had a celibate clergy, and confirmation was only by a bishop. The Greek priests were married. To them, as we have noted, the Roman insistence on a celibate clergy smacked of Manichaeism, and confirmation was by the priest. Moreover, the Latins were putting filioque into the creed, which is usually called Nicene, saying that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, whereas the original of the formula spoke of the Holy Spirit only as proceeding from the Father. The insertion had developed in the West in conflict with Arian Christianity, the faith of the Goths who ruled in Spain and part of Italy. To state their position as against the Arians, the Catholic Latin clergy had framed a creed, possibly, as we have seen, originally a hymn, which was commonly given the name of Athanasius because the Arians called the Catholics Athanasians. That creed had filioque. The Latins added the phrase to the Nicene symbol, presumably to bring that and the Athanasian symbol into accord. This seems to have been done first at Toledo in Spain in 589 or 653 to signalize the conversion of the Visigoths from Arianism to Catholicism. While in St. Peter's in Rome, the popes did, did not use filioque until early in the 11th century, the custom had gradually spread through the West, and in 809, under Charlemagne, a synod at Aachen had given us 
had given its approval. The Greeks were not averse to saying that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father through the Son, but objected to saying, and the Son. Then, too, in contrast with Greek custom, the Latins fasted on Saturdays and used milk, butter, and cheese in Lent. The struggle for Bulgaria continued. At first, Boris seemed to have been won by the Pope's envoys. Partly to offset this success, in 867, Photius called a synod in Constantinople, which condemned Pope Nicholas and tried to wean the Franks from him by acclaiming, with the consent of Michael and Bardas, the Carolingian Louis, the Carolingian Louis II of that people as joint emperor. Then came a sudden reversal. Basil the Macedonian, of humble Armenian origin, murdered Bardas in 866 and was made joint emperor with Michael, and in 867 had the latter assassinated while drunk. These deaths deprived Photius of his two most powerful backers, and freed Ignatius, who was still living, from his most, from his most influential enemies. Basil had the support of the party of Ignatius. Under the circumstances, Photius resigned, and Ignatius was reinstated as patriarch. Hoping to bring unity in the Byzantine Church, Basil now referred to the Pope, the whole tangled issue of Ignatius and Photius. A new pontiff, Hadrian II, was now on the chair of Peter. At a synod in Rome in 869, Hadrian decided against Photius and for Ignatius. In 869-70, a poorly attended synod was held in Constantinople, some members of which assented to the papal condemnation of Photius. However, there was no enthusiasm for conforming with Rome, and in spite of the protest of the Pope's representatives, by action of Basil, to whom the Synod referred the question, Bulgaria was placed under the Patriarch of Constantinople. Ignatius then consecrated an archbishop and several bishops in for Bulgaria. This angered the Pope, who held that his recognition of Ignatius had been conditional upon the latter's ascent to the Roman claims in Bulgaria. A reconciliation was effected between Basil and Photius, and the latter resumed, returned rather to court as a tutor to the emperor's sons. Ignatius and Photius also seemed to have made peace with each other. When the former died in 877, the latter quietly succeeded him as patriarch. From then until 886, his influence in church and state was at its height. More on the importance of Photius next time. Put in a link to three videos we did based on John 14 through 16. How will Christ's church abide after both Christ's death and the death of the apostles? It's pretty clear from chapters 14 to 16 that Christ was confident that it would, against the claims of many who claim that the church was doomed to apostasy after the death of the apostles. Christ evidently didn't think so. So, But in the first of those three videos that are linked together, which uh, gives the, the principle that we had to learn the hard way from, of course, being in a cult and leaving it, the principle of consensus. And from the very beginning, after the death of the apostles, the church has had a consensus as to what Christianity is. So I'll put the first of those videos in which which indicates that Christ knew in advance the difficulty many would have after the apostles died and had provided for it. See you next time.